okay, well, I still have to deliver, right? I can't just say, oh, well, never mind. No, I don't do that. Predict the size of the boat you need based on how many confirmed guests you have throughout the week. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Work From Home Nomad podcast. My name is Wilson. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Work From Home Nomad podcast. My name is Wilson. I'll be your host today. Uh, I'm here today with Stefan. Uh, got a couple of great topics to talk to Stefan about. Uh, but thanks for being on the podcast, Stefan. Really appreciate it. Uh, would you mind telling uh, me about yourself real quick as an intro? Yeah, absolutely, Wilson. Thanks for having me on here. So uh, real quick about me, uh, I grew up in Westchester, New York. Uh, I have, my dad is originally born in Italy, came to the U.S. as a kid. My mom originally born in uh, Greece, came to the U.S. a little bit older than my dad did. Also still a kid though. Uh, So I grew up in Westchester. I went to high school in Westchester, went to University of Connecticut, uh, majored in mechanical engineering, uh, got my degree uh, got a job in Connecticut for three years working for a, a company doing mechanical engineering related work. Uh, very quickly realized in 2013 that that was not going to be the rest of my life. I didn't vibe with living in Connecticut and working a job that I didn't really enjoy. Uh, and, uh, you know, when I was a little younger, when I was about 14, I actually had an interesting hobby for a 14 year old. I actually uh, collected autographs through the mail of baseball players writing them uh, handwritten letters. And then Mm -hmm. I went on to keep most of them, but sell some of them online as well. Uh, So I was always kind of a little bit entrepreneurial even when I was a kid. I don't know if it's uh, immigrant genes or what, but like just something related to always making me want to uh, do more than just the average thing. You know what I mean? So, Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, I got my engineering job and I realized that I was not fulfilled living in the middle of nowhere, Connecticut. I wanted to maybe move to the city, but there wasn't a ton of, engineering work in the city at the time. So I was like, what can I do? And I kind of went back to my entrepreneurial roots a little bit. And uh, more or less in 2014, I started these side hobbies online to make money, side hustles. Uh, And uh, more or less, I was able to leave my job in uh, 2015, moved to the city in 2016 in Manhattan. Then I bounced around a bit. I started traveling. That's when I started becoming like a part-time digital nomad uh, mm-hmm. and uh, bounced around between New York and Philadelphia as home bases. And then also did a good amount of world travel uh, during that time. And uh, a few business iterations later, I now have a software company with a high school friend who is uh, my co-founder. He's more on the development side. I do the marketing. I have the experience from all those random side hustles I did. Mm-hmm. And uh, in a nutshell, now I'm basing in New York City and uh, just taking it as it comes. Awesome. Uh, I love over you. Yeah. yeah, no, thanks. Uh, so I guess to, to summarize, uh, tech entrepreneur, uh, independent business owner. Um, and I think the the journey to get there was really interesting. It's a big reason why I, I just really wanted to grab time with you to talk about it. Um, I, I think one of the uh, things about your lifestyle is you took full ownership and you also wanted to travel a lot. Uh, so can you tell me a little bit about the, the lifestyle aspect? Um, you know, because it's, it's really easy to fall into the corporate America trap, I guess, quote unquote trap. Uh, but you made that decision, hey, I'm gonna take a risk. Uh, back in 2013, can you walk me through that? Because I, I think that's really interesting. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I think especially it's kind of funny because now we feel like we're in an age where the whole travel and work for yourself or at least remote work is a lot more popular yeah. than it was back then. But like at 2013, that wasn't a thing. Nobody was quitting their job to go start some internet business. It was very in its primal state. You know, It was happening, but it was very niche. Now it's kind of gone a lot more mainstream, but back then it was especially considered a crazy idea, you know? Now we have like all the social channels, influencers, blah, blah, blah. There's a lot of different ways. And it's been interesting for me to see it evolve since 2013. But back then, you know, I told my coworkers I wanted to quit my job and they thought I was nuts. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, oh, you're leaving an engineering job with benefits to go do your own thing. And I'm like, well, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but I think uh, honestly, the mindset behind it was, I'm very much a believer that once you have a working system uh, that like, 
like you believe you can scale up, your job is then holding you back. Mm -hmm. So for me, I had a few different uh, things I was doing to make money. One of them was um, I was selling things on eBay and I would literally go to garage sales. I'd have it with soccer moms on Facebook marketplace. And I would literally like just make like, you know, an extra 700 to $1,000 a month doing that. But my apartment was a mess. I had all this crap around that I had to uh, like ship out. So like, it was like, I was running like a little business at my tiny apartment in Connecticut. And I'm like, it, I didn't really enjoy that aspect, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Then I stumbled upon uh, this guy who was probably one of the first movers in terms of this whole movement of like working for yourself, who was selling a course on how to do uh, Kindle uh, ebook publishing. Mm -hmm. And what really appealed to me about that was I could create an ebook once and sell it as many times as I wanted. I didn't have to keep, uh, you know, uh, procuring new products to sell. I could just sell this digital product once. Mm -hmm. right. I'm sorry, create it once and then sell it as many times as I want. So more or less, I went that route. Uh, and I was making, a, I had a little side business selling these ebooks. Um, and then that kind of evolved when I realized that guy was making more money selling his course about ebooks than he was actually doing the method. And I'm like, there's a lot of money in selling knowledge, selling mm -hmm. courses, information marketing. Yeah. So I kind of went down that rabbit hole because I had a side business. Um, also, there was a dog website, mm -hmm. uh, and essentially, I would drive traffic to that dog website uh, from Pinterest. I drove over a million organic visitors, mm -hmm. and I literally, like, well, I'm like, oh, my God, I could teach business owners how to drive traffic from Pinterest, so yeah. I started this little course, uh, and basically, at that point, you know, it's, I was still working my job, but, like, I started making a few thousand dollars a month selling this Pinterest course, mm -hmm. and I was thinking to myself, I'm like, if I got, if I went down the road of information marketing full time, and I didn't have my job that was taking 45 plus hours a week, maybe I could scale this up, right? Okay, so yeah. I, I all, I'm a very big believer you shouldn't just quit your job with no, no idea, right? You have to have at least something sort of working that you yeah. believe you can scale up before you quit. Don't leave without at least one other income source. Mm -hmm. So I had that. I was like, I totally think I can scale this. I also, another thing that was important is I surrounded myself I, I couldn't do this in person because I was in the middle of nowhere, Connecticut, but like online, I found these communities of entrepreneurs around the world. And that propelled me into seeing if I surround myself, like at least virtually with these people, that, that this is a reality for them. Mm -hmm. It becomes a reality for me. If yeah. I hang out with these engineers over here that aren't doing this and they don't even think it's a reality, of course it's not going to become a reality. Right. Right. So I switched my, uh, who I surrounded myself with at least at first virtually. Yeah. And that made a huge difference. Okay. So, so, so to kind of summarize, like a big part of it was putting myself in the right environments and having at least one proven income source that could replace my new job. And when I had both of those, I was like, all right, now is the time to quit. That was uh, going to be my next question. What's the biggest lessons you've learned since 2013? Can you think of anything other than uh, making sure you have another income source before you make the decision to quit and then making sure you surround yourself with the right people whether it's virtual or not. Um, anything else that, you know, since 2013 to today? Oh, a lot. I'll try to keep it short. <laughs> but uh, one of them for sure is um, be flexible, right? Be open because a lot of people will come up with a business idea, not put it against the actual like market environment and be like, oh, well, I guess that failed. But like be willing to like iterate on your idea. I've yeah. had probably at least 10 to 20 different products I've launched in for, you know, information related products. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, even outside of Pinterest, I've had a couple of software iterations I've launched. And as you know, I've even launched a few communities over the years. So I've, I've built a lot of things. Only a few of them have really taken off. A lot mm -hmm. of people launch one idea and then they go, oh, well, it didn't work. I'm like, well, you didn't, like, there was no tie of that idea to like the market itself. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? They have to, yeah. they, they have to be related. Cool. So. Yeah, definitely. And then, um, can you tell me a little bit about your, your business? Uh, I took a look at the Instagram page um, and just wanted to know, number one, what is it called? And then number two, what does it do? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, in a nutshell, before this current business, right? Um, so I run a software, I co-founded a software called Webinar Kit. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is a platform for primarily business owners and marketers to uh, combine the power of webinars and marketing to sell more of their products and get their message out there. Mm -hmm. um, the idea came from the fact that before I was doing this software, I had the Pinterest business, I had an information course. That business that I mentioned earlier, at one point evolved into course, coaching, consulting, and then agency. Mm -hmm. So the way in which I got clients was a webinar. That webinar, I drove traffic to the webinar and it was automated. Mm -hmm. And in 2019, I had a month where I was in Greece for a whole month. Mm -hmm. This webinar ran automated 
Uh, and basically, I had a record income month that month of just having this webinar running automated, procuring me clients. And I was like, "There's, it's called an automated webinar, and it's very, very powerful. So essentially, at that point, a friend of mine who was a software engineer Priceline here in, in New York City said to me, well, I have an idea. Why don't we do this automated webinar thing, but we'll make like a better software that's like, because you're a marketer, you're actually using it. Yeah. We'll make it based on like what you think it needs. Mm -hmm. So lo and behold, we launched Webinar Kit in January 2020, which was really weird timing with the fact that the whole world was doing webinars, even the, the pandemic a couple years, a couple months later. But it was kind of good timing for us in that way. But basically, we've been in business now for three and a half years and full steam ahead. That's awesome. Um, I think one of the biggest lessons I've learned uh, of my career so far is purpose. I think there's just nothing better than purpose. Um, there's a lot of way to make money, uh, especially with the internet boom of the 2000s. There's a lot of creative ways to, to make money, um, but ultimately you need to do something where you can get through the week, where it's like, oh, I'm just having fun. Um, and I mean, like that's, that's a little cliche because like everybody talks about it, but I feel like once I got to actually working, it's so true. I'd rather work 60 hours a week where I'm just in total control. I'm really loving it. And rather than like 20 hours a week where I'm just a little bit lost or um, I'm just not in control. Uh, so that's one of the biggest lessons I've learned. And really interesting to hear uh, your, your big lessons, being flexible um, and the, the other two things you mentioned. Yeah. Uh, yeah, let's switch topics to, to today. So 2023. You're here in Astoria, in New York City. Uh, you're you're fully remote. Curious, why New York City? Why Astoria? Um, and I'm glad I caught you. So a little personal news for Stefan. He's he's going to Greece. Uh, is it next week? But uh, uh, a little less than two weeks from now. Okay. And you know why all those things? You know you're a location independent person. So how do you choose where to go and where to stay? That's a great question. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think, uh, and this is also another something I learned uh, to tie into what we, what we were just talking about. It's so important to have like, well, I kind of touched on it, but surrounding yourself with like the right people. So when you work for yourself, there are no coworkers, right? Like I've got a team virtually, I've got a co-founder, but like for the most part, like every day, I probably have a lot less interaction than the average person does. So I think it's so important to like find your community and like build it. And, um, you know, when I turned about 30, I'm 32 now. So when I turned 30, I kind of had this mass exodus of like college friendships and like people from the past who were your friends, right? Things change. People get married, they move to the suburbs, they start having kids. And you don't hear from a lot of the people that you thought you were going to keep hearing from. Mm -hmm. So I was in this state now where I was, had been traveling a lot. So over the course of the last few years, you know, while was, my business became solidified, I had spent extended stays in Latin America, Asia, parts of Europe for, you know, a month, two months, sometimes six months at a time. And uh, during that period, I became much more close to people in those locations than I felt in my home country. Mm -hmm. So I, and it was a vicious cycle because the more I traveled, the more I felt disconnected when I came back here. And I realized that I had to kind of like, I'm a, I'm a citizen of this country and uh, I am working on procuring Greek citizenship right now. That's a whole other conversation. <laughs> but uh, at the moment, it's like, I live here. I want to, I want to feel comfortable in my home base. Right. And to what you asked earlier, I chose a story in New York as my home base because I love this neighborhood. Uh, it does have some Greek roots, which I relate to. Uh, but also in general, it's just a cool neighborhood and you hear so many languages on the street. Sometimes it makes me feel like I am in a different country mm -hmm. and I enjoy that. I like that vibe. Uh, it's like, it's busy, but not overly busy. Um, it's also a little bit cheaper than living in Manhattan, which if you're going to be traveling a lot, you know, you don't really necessarily want to shell out 5k for one bedroom if you're, you're going to be on the road. And so right. for me, it's the perfect level of, um, busy. It's the perfect, interesting vibe. Uh, it's close to the airports. So it's just, a, it's like a really great home base for me. So when I kind of realized that, I realized I wanted to be a, come closer to this community. Mm -hmm. So when I was living in Mexico a few years ago, I actually built an online business owners community uh, that every week people would meet on a rooftop. And we had about 50 to 100 business owners from all over the world come to this rooftop. And it was so fun. And I was like, I want to take that concept and try to bring it to New York. Mm -hmm. So I launched about four months ago, this thing called Astoria Connect. And the general idea is just connect people in Astoria that are open to that, right? Okay. Because yeah, so like when you go around the city, right? Sometimes if you're new here, especially if you're working for yourself, sometimes it's hard to meet people, right? 
right? right? People hang out with their coworkers. A lot of people are working 50 hours a week, so they, they, they don't barely have time to go out and socialize and mingle. So how do you find the people that are willing to connect? Yeah. Well, build an event and put the right messaging in front of them and say, this is for people who right now are looking to connect, the people yeah. that are open, that are friendly. Put them all in one place. And then it makes it easier for everyone else there. Anyone with, I make people wear name tags in my events. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, and we do your, your name. You don't put what you do on here. You put something funny or interesting about yourself. In some cases, that could be funny or interesting. But Icebreakers. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> so, uh, but, you know, anyone with a name tag at that event, you know, is approachable. You know, that's someone who's there because they're looking to make a friend. Yeah. So I started that a few months ago. The events have gotten up to 80 to 100 people every time. And it's been so great to see that I've been able to make a handful of new friends, like people I feel really close to in the community mm -hmm. through that uh, event. And that's how it's really supposed to work. Build yeah. an event, people will come, you find the people you vibe with. So as I've gotten older, I've realized more and more the importance of community. Uh, and especially in a time where, especially in this nation, people are feeling more isolated, more disconnected. Yeah. So how do you fix that? You have to build something for people to go to so that they can feel more connected. And I felt, I felt kind of called to do that, and I feel very fulfilled doing that alongside my main business. Mm -hmm. Stefan for president, maybe. Uh, yeah, no, a couple of things to that. I, I love what you said. Uh, the first thing was, as you've gotten older, and I'm saying this because I feel the exact same sentiment, Yeah. Uh, people come and go in your life, uh, and then there's a certain path that you decide you're going to take um, as you get older and older. Uh, people start having kids, et cetera, right? It's about the stage of life that you're in, the, the common interests. And I've had conversations with this, uh, about this with some of my friends recently, is that, hey, I'm in, I'm in software, I'm in product management, uh, I like traveling, and I like going out to bars, and I like to make new friends and meet new people. These are the types, and like there can be variations, right? It doesn't have to be product management, for example. Uh, but these are the types of people I wanna hang out with. And I almost had, I would say, kind of like a, I want to call it a crisis, but more of a, oh shit moment, where when I was traveling earlier this year, and uh, where was I, Serbia, um, I met a lot of really cool people, but I realized I didn't really have much in common with them. And it kind of, it was my oh shit moment. So then whenever I came to New York, I, I started hanging out with people like you, started hanging out with people uh, like a bunch of my friends who I hang out with now who have those similar interests. And guess what? And maybe in 10 years, uh, we'll have kids. We'll probably be doing the same thing. Yeah. We'll probably be hanging out with other parents and be like, Hey, my kid just did, did this. <laughs> what do you think I should do in response? You know, like you're going to have these common interests, um, uh, and like similar activities. And so you're going to want to share those ideas. And that's something I've realized recently too. Uh, there's something else that you just said, I forgot was it, I should just write this down, next time. but, um, community, community. Yeah. Okay. So actually I just thought that your, your Mexico example, I, I, I thought that was really interesting. I, I love what you said. Um, uh, and I think, uh, one of the things that you're doing a really great job of, and then what I'm trying to start doing and, um, is hosting events. Uh, so what is it about hosting events that you like? Um, why do you think it's, uh, something that you invest time in? Yeah. Yeah, for, for sure. I think a lot of it really just comes down to that, um, the need, you know, and like, I, I kind of like being able to like, there's this narrative, right. And like, it's, I realized this is an interesting kind of realization for myself. Maybe this was my oh shit moment. Uh, but basically like, you know, as you, when you work your day job, right. When I, when you talk to people and you complain, oh, I, I can't believe it. Like the narrative is, oh, well, that's just how it is. Right. I noticed when I had the same problem when I turned 30 and I had more friends around the world than I did in the States. Yeah. Everyone said, well, that's just how it is. Adult friendships, they suck. Right. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, but that means only if you settle for that. Right. Yeah. So I was like, I didn't settle for my job when everyone around me told me that's just how it is. Right. I, I'm sure it's not going to settle when it comes to finding great friendships after age 30. Mm -hmm. Of course it's possible. Yeah. So, um, I, you know, I just kind of realized that, uh, just because there's a, a societal narrative doesn't make it true. 
And actually, I became very uh, jaded by societal narratives because I basically defied most of them. And I'm like, I'm not going to listen to just what people say and that's how it is and you just have to deal with it. No, mm-hmm. I'm going to build something great that defies that narrative. And yeah. so far, it's been, both in Mexico and here, it's been very successful. So I just truly believe that, you know, and to be fair, most of the people who are coming to these events are people late 20s to as high as 40s mm-hmm. that are looking to connect. So there's yeah. a lot of people after 30 that, that are in the same boat that necess- haven't necessarily moved on to having a family and connecting with people at school, right? There's still a lot of people that are prioritizing, prioritizing other things and they want to connect. Yeah. So that market is there. and Those people need someone to just put them together. Mm-hmm. And I have that skill set. I run a lot of webinars. Yeah. It turns out webinars mm-hmm. and in-person events are... Very similar. In terms very of transferable. Yeah. Very transferable <laughs> skills. So I was like, and copywriting, right? Mm-hmm. Copywriting is so important. So um, I also read a book uh, when I was in Mexico this time around. I was in Mexico uh, in February. Uh, and I read a book called uh, The Two Hour Cocktail Party. Have okay. you read this book? By no. Nick Gray, I think it is. Sure. And basically, he, te- he basically talked about how he moved to Austin and he, had, he was dealing, facing a similar problem. And he started hosting these two hour uh, happy hours in his apartment. And he was big on the name tags. He's like, you have to, he was, had a very specific layout on how he ran the events. I'm not as uh, uh, strict as he is. Yeah. But what I realized the common denominator was, was getting people together, A, consistently, yeah. and B, with some sort of uniting cause. Mm-hmm. So I was like, I have to build those two things and the name tags. So I, I took a few elements from what that guy was doing, combined with what I, my own experience, and that's kind of how I created this. Uh, and uh, yeah, so more or less, that's it, you know, and then being able to consistently bring people together under that brand, connecting people in between events. It's another important thing about the yeah. WhatsApp group. Mm-hmm. So yeah, so that's kind of it. The WhatsApp group, I think you told me this uh, when we had Korean barbecue a month or two months ago, mm-hmm. the WhatsApp group was genius. Like, hey, here's a WhatsApp group. So then after they attend the event, uh, you send the blast. You're like, hey, by the way, there's another one next week or in two weeks. And you get these it's the idea of uh, retention, I guess, recurring yeah. yep. uh, guests. And then another thing that one of my friends, he hosts events all the time too. One of the things that I took from him, I, I took this page out of his book, which is whenever you sign up on whether it's Luma or Partyful, you have the option as a host to configure fields. So such as, uh, you know, what's your LinkedIn profile? What's your Instagram handle? Uh, what do you hope to get out of this event? What do you think you can contribute to this event? And so you input all that information and then you sign up. Uh, and then at the end, after the event, the host sends an email to all the guests with all the information so that if you somehow forgot to uh, get somebody's contact information, you have it. And I was like, wow, that's really genius. That's a great way to make sure that you get people connected um, you bring that sense of community. I love what you just said. Uh, and because at the end of the day, whenever you're hosting and you see people exchanging information, I, I don't know about you, but I feel like that's a really rewarding feeling. You're like, Hey, I just started something. hundred percent. There's been so many groups that have, and great, great, uh, point on the fields. Uh, so on our events, we, I keep it pretty basic, uh, mm-hmm. but there's always room for improvement on, uh, you know, doing that. So, and Luma is a great platform though. I have, we're currently using Partyful, but I was at some point when I put more effort, this is also something I do on the side, right? Yeah. So yeah. At some point I'd like to scale up to Luma just because it does allow you to do a lot more and mm-hmm. really take things to the next level. But I think the key here is just like for anyone who does want to start events, like just start, like I'm not doing it perfect. I just build it. Uh, and the fact that I'm taking consistent action is what's. Yeah, it grow. it's and by no means doing it optimized. Mm-hmm. It's consistent. That's the most important. Thing. Yeah. So I hosted an event in April. You came to that one. That was a great event. Yeah, I wanted it so. to be just friends. Um, and then I hosted a second event the next month. Um, I would say that one was you know, a little disappointing as a host. It hurts. Mm-hmm. It hurts the host's ego whenever not a whole lot of people show up. Right. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I learned from that event was you have to expect people to flake. Okay. And it's okay, right? Like, you know, nobody's nobody's like supposed to come, right? So, yeah. Um, and then one of the other ways to to manage that is a make sure your friends are coming, but also which 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 happened. But B, if you make people pay 
even if it's five dollars, they're less likely to flake. And so I kept that in mind whenever I was talking to my friend who was also hosting a big event. Uh, I was helping him recruit. I was like reaching out to my own friends. Hey, do you want to come to my uh, my friend's event? And he was a little nervous about people flanking. And I said, well, you just charge people $50. They're not going to flake. Don't worry. Because there, it's that, um, what's the phenomenon? It's the sunk cost fallacy. It's like, yeah. well, I already paid. I have to go. It's, it's psychological, right? Yeah, it's so, a, they've already committed uh, to some levels. And they're like, you know, I want to lose out on what they already put into it. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> Um, it's very, very powerful. Uh, I have not had an experience with paid events yet. That's something I'd like to do at some point. I've always been a fan of the freemium model, like get them in and then mm -hmm. like, you know what I mean? Like, so, uh, I don't make anything on these events, but like, yeah. uh, you know, I've been the idea, like, so for the, the places that let me host, right? Like I'm bringing them a lot of business, so right? They let me host for free and I'm not paying anything to host there. That is awesome. Yeah. yeah so cool. it's like, find out. And I did that in Mexico. I, in Mexico, I went on the top of the bar. I said, Hey, we're going to pack your bar. It was dead, completely dead. I'm like, hey, bartender, or whoever, like, we're gonna put 100 people uh, on your roof once a week. He's like, okay. It was that easy. Right? And, you know, here in, in the city, things work a little bit more complicated, but there's yeah. plenty of places you could find where they're just happy that you're bringing them people and they for have sure. a big space. Yeah. They'll let you host for free. Mm -hmm. And as you remember, we we dealt with some places that want to charge you. Right. But you know what? There's enough places out there that if you look, they'll let you do it for free. That's where I grab. Too. Right, right. Now on the concept of paid events, how did how did that go? Because I'd be curious to see how that. Went. Yeah, so it's a uh, the dinner table. Um, my I, I'm actually hoping to interview my roommate next. Uh, his name is Lawrence. It's it's meant to be a platform for artists to speak, and it's supposed to be really bougie. Um, that's the informal way of saying it. That's my opinion, <laughs> which is probably reality it's too. Here. Private chefs. Um, what else? I mean, it's like really fancy. So that's the vibe. And whenever he hosted it, it was a success. Um, so I'm going to the next one. Uh, by the way, if you want to come, it's uh, next Thursday. It's this Thursday. So I'll send you the invite. Um, the invite. And yeah, so I, it just depends on the vibe. And the, the, the setting was very well executed. I was very impressed with Lawrence and his hosting skills there. Um, Let's shift gears a little bit to the future because I think with me, at least I'm very much into my corporate America job, or I should say my corporate America role and career. Uh, and kind of what, what we were talking about in the beginning was purpose. I really like purpose. I feel like whenever I go to work, um, the things that I will be doing will be impactful. I mean, it sounds really cheesy, but, uh, I mean, again, you can, you can work any job you want. You can make money. There's a lot of different ways of making money, but if you feel that drive where you just get out of bed every morning, you're like, Oh, like I love doing what I do. I think that's just the most important thing. Um, I doubled down on what I thought in college. Uh, that's, that's exactly what I thought in college. And I doubled down on that today. Uh, anyways, I think at some point, even if I get enough net worth or income, I probably will continue working. And that probably is the American of me. We, we are workaholics. <laughs> um, but at also some point I can see myself retiring with Bay, future Bay, uh, whoever you may be, if you're listening, um, you're a candidate maybe, I don't know, we'll see. Great guy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you make me blush. Um, what if we, you know, settle down in Portugal or in Thailand? Uh, I would like to be very open-minded to something like that. Uh, and also, yeah, maybe retire early, who knows, and just travel the world. So yeah, curious if you have any of those aspirations. For me, uh, I, I love traveling, as you know. I know you love traveling, so curious to hear your thoughts there. Oh, I have a lot of thoughts on this. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, on, on, as far as, like, the whole working thing, look, I mean, I truly believe it's about what you, like, if you enjoy what you're doing and it works for you, that's the most important. It's not about having a job or not having a job. I just know for a fact that job that I had was not going to be what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. I found something that I'm good at that I really enjoy. It lets me live the lifestyle that I want to live. If you have a job that you enjoy, that you feel fulfilled at, that also lets you live the lifestyle you want to live, that's great, man. You know, I think that uh, it's really just about doing what you enjoy and uh, if you know, not settling. I think that's my biggest thing is don't settle for something 
if it really truly does improve for you. Uh, you know, I think about my co-founder. Uh, you know, he was at a cushy development job in the city, making very big money, didn't have to work very hard. And if I had that situation, maybe I wouldn't have quit my job. Mm -hmm. I mean, it took yeah. me being in a situation that I actually really didn't like. Right. You know what I mean, so I do wonder, like, if I had a job I liked, would it be different? Right? Mm -hmm. I, I do wonder. Either way, I'm kind of glad I didn't have a job I liked because it kind of forced me into this position. Yeah. But on the on the concept of uh, of America and you know potentially living outside the states, I um, I realized like how much a lot of America has been built for the nine to five culture. Yeah. Like even in New York, right? It's considered the city that never sleeps. But as you know, when you travel the world, it's not really true. Right. There's a lot of other parts of the world that are living lifestyles that aren't centric around the nine to five, and thus they actually are living lifestyles that don't sleep. Mm -hmm. You know, because like the nine to five is an American thing, right? Henry Ford. Now, a lot of the world has adopted that, but not to the same degree that the United States had. Yeah. So I realized how much like me being working for myself, even in New York City, people here are working. People here are doing their thing. And like, so the lifestyle that I'm used to living when I travel, where you connect with all these nomads and you go to the coffee shop at 2 p.m., you, you know, it's, it's, it's very different. It's very structured around like uh, lifestyle businesses, whereas like New York is not. It's mm -hmm. not, and a lot of the, the nomads don't come here because it's too expensive, right? A lot of people that are just starting their businesses, it's like not affordable for them. Right. So I think about that a lot. And uh, on that note, I have given thought to, like I said, I'm looking to procure Greek citizenship uh, and having that option to settle outside the States just as an option. I'm not saying that I'm definitely gonna do it, but it's something I think about because there are other places, like as you know, Portugal, and there's other spots where like people are leaving the United States in record numbers to go to places like Portugal to live mm -hmm. there and right. other places. And I, I I understand why, right? I completely a, a more affordable cost of living. Mm -hmm. uh, people prioritizing different types of lifestyles. Yeah, more freedom, more flexibility, more self exploration. Uh, it, it, it's and when you go there, you're like, wow, a lot of the problems back home just don't exist here. Right. I mean, that's another aspect of it, but, um, you know, it's, it's an option. It's very much an option for me right now. I, I like being in New York because it has, it does have that hustle culture, which I like, and because I am working a lot, I am building right now and I am close to all the airports. Yeah. It's a good home base for me, but in the future, who knows what that's going to hold. Maybe it does entail leaving the country. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. Um, quick lightning round question. Top three favorite countries in the world. Ooh, that's a tough one. Uh, so I've been to about, I think I've been to way less countries than you, but I've been to about like 21 countries, I think. So I'm basing on that. Uh, I think you've been to what, 50 or something like that? It's, it's 50 now. Yeah. Wow, that's yeah. crazy. I was collecting them like stamps back in 2015 or 2016, which I realized after my experience in Brazil, it's just not worth it. Yeah. I'd rather like know a culture really, really well than know five different cultures two days each uh, to me it just not fulfilling so i agree with that completely the yeah. minimum i go somewhere is one month absolute minimum mm -hmm. usually two three four or six because you do need to immerse yourself and yeah. build a lifestyle there it's so much different than like oh are you hitting up five things a day i'm like that's stressful yeah what do you want to do <laughs> uh but on that note i mean out of all the countries i've visited this is a tough one um, I'm a little biased to Greece just because I have some kind of, you know, roots there, but, uh, I love Greece. I think that's gotta be in the top three. Yeah. Beautiful country, beautiful people, amazing food. Everyone's friendly. Um, you know, they, they, it's just, a, everything is amazing there. Um, I gotta say, I loved Argentina. I was only in Buenos Aires, but yeah. oh my God, amazing, uh, people, amazing food. I was there for the world cup. Oh, so that was, nice. you know, they went nuts uh, for a few days. So beautiful culture is all I can say. Um, I think outside of that, I really loved Thailand. I thought Thailand was amazing. I mean, seeing the, the, the contrast between a city like Bangkok and the islands, mm -hmm. uh, I love that. I love that you have, you have the city vibe and the islands like an hour flight apart from each other. Any vibe you want is there. Um, the people also very peaceful. It's like it's primarily what Buddhist. So it's like mm -hmm. I, I just found it really, really cool. Awesome. Yeah, I, I mean I've been to Athens. Uh, I mean this was back in my collecting stamps uh, phase, but I, I've been to Athens for like three days. Uh, I've been to Bangkok for two days. Uh, I would really like to check out the islands of Thailand. And I've heard such great things. Uh, so my job is very meetings heavy especially during the U.S. working hours. 
for me, it makes sense to, to stay on this side of the world, which would include US, Canada, and Latin America, Caribbeans. Uh, and then if I'm feeling a little bit ambitious, that would take me to Europe where I'm working two to 10. Yep. Uh, the most extreme that I've done is Jordan, which was 6 p.m. to 2 a.m. Wow. And that was rough. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't think I would do it for longer than three weeks. I did it for three weeks. Yeah. Um, got to see Petra. So it was great, great experience. I don't know if I would do something like that again. Maybe four to 12 I could do. Um, but certainly not Asia because it's literally uh, a 12 hour uh, difference, right? So one of the ways to mitigate that that I've thought of is hosting like some sort of community. Okay, back to the hosting thing, right? The hosting community in Bali where you have uh, maybe a dozen or two dozen people-ish where everybody's working US hours. So everybody's working during the nights and then after work, they would have quote unquote breakfast um, after they surf or something like that. And then they go to bed at 8 a.m. and then start the day at 5 p.m. Or, or 6 p.m. or whatever. I thought about doing that um, because part of the reason why I don't want to do Asia is because I want to enjoy the lifestyle. I want to be immersed in the culture. Um, so I feel like it would just be almost like a waste. Mm -hmm. uh, but I thought about doing stuff like that as well. Yeah. On the side note, Argentina is great for the nine to five work week because it's it's two hours ahead. Mm -hmm. So it's like you start at eleven and you end at uh, seven. So it's just it, I, anyone who was working the nine to five when I was down there, they're like, this is so great because you can go out. You can, is that a culture there starts very late? Yeah. Dinner start at like nine. Mm -hmm. So you finish at like you, know, you start at eleven. You could go out every night. Yeah. You could go to dinner after seven. You know what I mean? So it's like it's actually great. Two hours ahead of an Eastern is a great little nesting spot for that. Yeah, so, for sure. Um, so I guess we're coming up at time closely, but one more question. Uh, I mean, where do you see yourself in five to 10 years? Uh, oh boy. <laughs> and <laughs> it's a daunting question, but yeah. any thoughts there? I mean, uh, very possible we could have exited this company by then, uh, or still be focusing on it. Mm -hmm. um, I do wonder like about future business ventures. I mean, I feel like we're just getting started with webinar kit, but with software, it's one of those things where overnight things could change just like that. Yeah. So um, we're, we've got some momentum right now. Things are going, things are going overall very well. Um, so I think uh, five to 10 years, who knows, maybe having exited this business, maybe starting another one, maybe settling down, maybe living in Portugal. Maybe, <laughs> I mean, uh, I'd say that the, uh, there is endless possibilities in that. Yeah. I, I mean, I used to hate that question because that's a, an actual question for corporate America. But as I've gotten more cemented in my path, I, I feel like I start enjoying those types of questions uh, just because I know, hey, this is for a fact. I, I like, I'm interested in this. Uh, and then you just have to stay flexible. One of the themes of this episode, stay flexible. I, I love that. Uh, and just read and react to whatever comes to you. Um, so anyways, yeah, very important. I appreciate it, Stefan. Uh, thanks so much for joining the pod, uh, work from home, nomad podcast. You're forever, uh, in our history. Appreciate it. Glad to be here. <laughs> All right, man. Peace.